Welcome to Orbital Dynamics Part 18. In this part, I'm going to teach you Galilean and Newtonian laws of motion. I've taught you Kepler's laws of orbital motion. These are geometric laws that do a pretty good job of predicting the paths of orbits. They don't, however, explain the inherent forces that cause these orbits. When Newton developed his laws of motion and his law of gravity, he was able to derive Kepler's laws and was able to predict other kinds of orbital motion that Kepler didn't predict, like parabolic and hyperbolic trajectories. In this part, I'll teach you Newton's basic laws of motion. I'll teach you Newton's laws of gravitation and how he used that to derive Kepler's law laws in a future part. This is from Wikipedia. Newton's laws of motion are the three physical laws that together laid the foundation for classical mechanics. They describe the relationship between a body and the forces acting upon it, and its motion in response to those forces. More precisely, the first law defines the force qualitatively, the second law offers a quantitative measure of the force, and the third asserts that a single isolated force doesn't exist. These three laws have been expressed in several ways over the centuries and can be summarized as follows. The first law, in an inertial frame of reference, an object either remains at rest or continues to move at a constant velocity unless acted upon by a force. An inertial frame of reference is one that has no force acting upon it. If you were floating around in space feeling weightless, you'd be in an inertial frame. If you're feeling a force, then you're not in an inertial frame of reference. The second law, in an inertial frame of reference, the vector sum of forces F on an object is equal to the mass M of that object multiplied by the acceleration A of the object. This is expressed as F equals MA. I'm gonna spend a lot of time on this law. This law allows me to characterize motion mathematically. The third law, when one body exerts a force on a second body, the second body simultaneously exerts a force equal in magnitude and opposite in direction to the first body. Some describe a fourth law, which states that individual simultaneously forces add up into a net force with one magnitude and one direction. Said another way, forces obey the principle of superposition. You can sum up multiple forces and express them as a single force vector. This principle greatly simplifies the math. The three laws of motion were first compiled by Isaac Newton in his Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy, or Philosophy Naturalis Principia Mathematica. It was first published in 1687. Newton used these laws to explain and investigate the motion of many objects and systems. Here are the laws in Newton's own words. Law one, every body persists in a state of being at rest or moving uniformly straightforward, except insofar as it is compelled to change its state by force impressed. Law two, the alteration of motion is ever proportional to the motor force impressed and is made in the direction of the right line in which the force is impressed. Notice that the formula F equals MA doesn't appear here. Law three, to every action there is always opposed an equal reaction or the mutual actions of two bodies upon each other are always equal and directed to contrary parts. I'm gonna go through each of Newton's laws. I'll start with the first law, the law of inertia. If we go back to Aristotle, he and his followers held that a body in continuous motion could only maintain its motion if there was a continuous external force. This makes intuitive sense. If my car runs out of gas on a perfectly level road, I can't just give it one push and have it roll on its own to the nearest gas station. I have to push it continuously. Likewise, an airplane has to constantly propel itself to stay aloft. If you turn the engines off, it may glide for a while, but will eventually fall out of the sky. In both cases, constant forces are required. Aristotle believed that if the motion is continuous, there must be a continuous force. A projectile moving through the air would only continue its motion, he asserted, if a constant force were exerted. Aristotle asserted that there were eddies or vibrations in the surrounding medium that kept things in motion. Jean Buridan, years, after Galileo, years before Galileo and Newton, suggested a concept called impetus, which proposed that motion of a moving body was re the result of some property that was imparted when the body was set in motion. It's believed he named this motion maintaining property impetus 
although the theory probably didn't originate from him. He was just the first to write about it. Galileo later, later called this inertia. Inertia is the tendency of objects to remain in constant motion. The law of inertia states that an object once set in motion tends to resist changes in motion. Galileo restated Bredon's description of motion in a void as a basic physical principle. A body moving will continue in the same direction at a constant speed unless disturbed. Galileo wrote that all external impediments removed, a heavy body on a spherical surface concentric with the earth will maintain itself in that state in which it has been. If placed in movement toward the west, it will maintain itself in that movement. A ship, having once received some impetus through the tranquil sea, would move continually around our globe without ever stopping. Now, that doesn't work with a real ship at sea, but unbeknownst to Galileo, it does work for satellites in space. <laughs> the Aristotelian model did not take into account forces counteracting forward motion. With the law of inertia, objects in motion slow down because of counteracting forces like friction or in this case, the wind. Otherwise, they'd remain in motion. An object in water when propelled travels farther than an object on the ground because there's less frictional resistance. An object on wheels does likewise than an object sitting on the ground. If you get rid of the counter opposing friction, one push will make the object go to infinity. When I talked about the law of falling bodies in part 13, I mentioned that Galileo measured the speed at which balls rolled down inclined ramps. He set up opposing ramps like this and noticed that after the ball rolled down the ramp and up on the left, it would roll to almost the same height. I said almost the same height. Galileo attributed the lesser height to friction. He thus theorized that in the absence of friction, the ball would roll down one ramp and up another and would always return to the same height. He theorized it would do this forever. The ramps, you'll notice, don't have to be at the same angle. As long as they're less than 90 degrees, the ball will reach the same height. In fact, the two ramps don't have to be at the same angle. So even at different angles, the ball always wants to go back to the same height. Galileo then theorized that if there was no second ramp, the ball would want to reach the same height, but wouldn't be able to. This led him to believe the ball would keep rolling forever to infinity. Concepts of inertia in Galileo's writings would later be refined by Isaac Newton as the first of his laws of motion. Newton wrote, unless acted upon by a net unbalanced force, an object will remain at a constant velocity. According to Newton, an object will stay at rest or stay in motion unless acted upon by an external force. Velocity in this context is a vector. Thus, Newton's constant velocity implies both speed and direction and includes the case of zero speed or no apparent motion. In his first law, Newton did not actually use the term inertia. Newton originally viewed the phenomenon as being caused by innate forces, inherent in matter, which resisted forces or acceleration. In modern classical physics, Inertia has come to be the name for the same phenomenon Newton described. In orbital dynamics, we study and characterize the motions of objects in orbit. What Newton's law of inertia implies is that a satellite really doesn't want to orbit the Earth. Once a force puts it in motion, it wants to travel in a straight line. According to Newton's first law, there must be a force that causes the orbit to curve along an ellipse. The other thing Newton's first law implies is that once an in orbit, a satellite will travel continuously as long as no force acts upon it, with the exception of the force that causes it to curve. As long as the satellite is well, be above, well above the atmosphere, it would conceivably orbit forever. Galileo was concerned with the description of motion, not with its causes. Central to his formulations was the law of inertia. He sought to describe theories of mechanics, but was never able to. That fell to Newton.
Galileo's law of inertia was Newton's first law of motion. The essential idea was that motion along a straight line at a constant speed was a natural state for any body. Newton's first law, the law of inertia, led to his second law. Newton's second law, in his own words, stated that the change of motion of an object is proportional to the force impressed and is made in the direction of the straight line in which the force is impressed. What Newton meant by motion not only involved not only a body's velocity, but also its mass. It's the quantity we call momentum, the product of the mass and velocity. If P is the momentum, then it's the mass times velocity. In this simple animation, the box was at rest until a force acted upon it. It then traveled across the screen until another force stopped it. Inertia is responsible for the continuous motion between the two forces. In fact, inertia is responsible for the box being at rest before and after the forces are applied. I want to formalize this mathematically. In the momentum equation for P, the bold characters P and V denote vectors. That means they have a magnitude and a direction. M, the mass, is a scalar. Force is also a vector, and it results in a change in momentum over time. Here, force F is the time derivative of the momentum. If I substitute mv for p, I get d dt of m times v. I can factor out the scalar m that results in m times dv dt. In part 13, I showed you that the change in velocity dv dt is equal to acceleration. Here I make that substitution, and from that I get f equals ma. Newton's second law tells us that F equals ma, force equals mass times acceleration. This is probably the most useful equation in physics. By the way, Newton never expressed his second law this way. Leonard Euler did 65 years later. What is force? In everyday language, it is associated with a push or a pull. When you push on something, you exert a force. When you're pushed, you feel a force acting on you. Forces originate outside the object whose motion we're considering. In other words, it's external forces acting on an object that will change its motion. I mentioned that satellites orbiting the Earth really want to travel in a straight line. Newton theorized that there must be some force that causes the satellite to change its direction. The red vector wants to be straight. The curvature of the orbit implies a change in velocity. This led to Newton's law of gravitation, which I'll talk about in the next part. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I do want to let you know that Einstein determined that gravity is actually a fictitional force. Thus, the satellite orbiting the Earth is following the curvature of space-time. While that's the most accurate model for orbital motion, Newton's equations of motion where a gravitational force is assumed are very useful. Newton added a third law to express what happens when body, bodies impart forces on each other. His third law is, to every action there is always opposed an equal reaction, or the mutual actions of two bodies upon each other are always equal and directed to contrary parts. The essence of the third law is action and reaction. When you push on anything, it pushes back on you with a force equal in magnitude in the opposite direction. The third law is a law of interactions. In this animation, block one is traveling at a fixed velocity, its momentum is its mass times that velocity. When it hits block two, it imparts a force on block two that increases its momentum. Likewise, block two imparts a force back on block one that decreases its momentum. If the masses are the same, the velocity that block one starts with equals the velocity that block two ends with. Block two was at rest at the beginning, which means that block one will be at rest at the end. Mathematically, Newton's third law implies that F sub 1 equals minus F sub 2. That's what's meant by equal and opposite. So F1 would equal minus M2A2, and that then means that M1A1 equals minus M2A2. The two momentums, P sub 1 and P prime sub 2, are also equal. This is intuitive since both are equal to 0. P prime sub 1 is also equal to P sub 2. Newton's third law is what explains rocketry. The expulsion of gas out of the bottom of a rocket creates an equal and opposite upward thrust. In a later part, I'll teach you the rocket equation that quantifies the force applied based on the expulsion of fuel from a rocket. This is Newton's cradle. It's a really good demonstration of Newton's third law.
The ball on the left imparts a force through the three middle balls. Only the rightmost ball moves. The rightmost ball then imparts a force back through the middle three balls. This also works with two balls, three balls, or four balls. If I move two, then it imparts a force on the two balls on the right. And this Newton cradle swings because it's not perfectly aligned. But if it were, the middle ball would stay stationary. I mentioned a fourth law, the superposition principle. That deals with multiple simultaneous forces. If multiple forces are applied at once, the net force is the vector sum of all those forces. Newton didn't have the math of vectors, but he knew that forces have magnitude and direction. This would be the vector for the net force. If F is the net force acting on a body, then it is the vector sum of all forces acting on the body. F sub n implies that there are multiple forces being summed. Newton characterized gravity as a downward force expressed here as G. The force comes from the mass of the Earth. Intuitively, you'd think that every bit of the Earth is exerting a force, and since the Earth is a sphere, the forces are coming from various directions. In order to make sense of orbital dynamics, however, we need to boil that down to a single force. I'll show you in a later part how that's done. For now, what I want you to take away is that the gravitational force is the summation of smaller forces that results in a net force. I want to draw a distinction between mass and weight. Mass is an intrinsic property of matter. All matter has mass. Every bit of mass creates a gravitational field, so you're going to see mass in many of the equations for orbital dynamics. Weight, on the other hand, is a measure of force. The gravitational field diminishes as you get farther away from the surface of the Earth. In fact, the gravitational field diminishes as you go below the surface of the Earth. There's much less gravity on the Moon and Mars, and there's a lot more on Jupiter. If an object is in free fall moving toward the Earth, it weighs nothing. As well, a satellite orbiting the Earth or another planet also weighs nothing. There's a gravitational force redirecting the path of the satellite, but it's essentially in free fall. Weight is a measure of force and thus varies based on location and how it's moving. Mass is intrinsic. Weight is typically measured on a spring scale. The reading on the scale is based on the amount of compression of the spring. You measure mass typically with a balance. You put what you want to measure on one side and a known mass on the other, and you keep adding bits of mass until the balance balances. Imagine putting both devices in an elevator. Now imagine the elevator descending. The spring scale while you're descending will register less weight because the elevator is moving downward. The elevator hopefully isn't in free fall, but the gravitational force G will be lessened. The reading on the balance, however, doesn't change. The lower gravitational force acts on both sides of the balance equally. If you take a scale to the moon where the gravity is significantly less, the mass of your body compresses the spring less, hence you weigh less. However, like the case of the elevator, the gravity on the moon affects both sides of the balance equally. You'd measure the same mass. Mass doesn't change, weight does. By the way, this scale is a balance scale. It would work fine in elevators and on the moon. The unit of mass in the metric system is a kilogram, abbreviated kg. It's equal to 1,000 grams. The unit of mass in the British engineering system is a slug. One slug is equal to 14.6 kilograms. Force is mass times acceleration. The unit of force is thus the kilogram meter per second squared, or Newton, abbreviated N, named after Isaac Newton. One Newton is the force required to accelerate a one kilogram mass at one meter per second squared. The unit of force in the CGS system is the dyne and is the force that will accelerate a one gram mass at an acceleration of one centimeter per second squared. One Newton equals 10 to the fifth dynes. In the British system, the, force, the units of force are pounds. One pound equals one slug foot per second or 4.45 Newtons. We're very attached to measuring weight in pounds, even though we may be dealing with mass. People who develop satellites and rockets also often use a unit called um, pounds of mass, or LBM. One kilogram equals 2.20462 pounds on the surface of the Earth. If LBM is pounds of mass, then LBF is pounds of force.
Orbital dynamics gets much simpler if we break motion down into components. I mentioned that the net force is the summation of all forces. In order to make sense of orbital motion, we need to go the other way and break down net forces and net motions into x, y, and z components or r and theta components. Force, acceleration, velocity, and position are all vectors. I'll show you here how they work as vectors. The vector formalism also makes orbital dynamics much easier. Let me start with explaining unit vectors. A unit vector is one whose length is equal to one. A vector has both magnitude and direction. With unit vectors, the magnitude is always one. What you're seeing here is the x, y, z coordinate system. The unit vector i runs along the x axis, the unit vector j is along the y axis, and the unit vector k is along the z axis. These three unit vectors are used to break down a vector in three dimensional space into x, y, and z components. The letters i, j, and k are a convention and weren't picked for any particular reason. Here's how they're used. If I multiply a sub x by i, I get a vector along the x-axis that is a sub x units long. Notice that the a sub x is not bold. a sub x is the scalar magnitude. It's the length of the vector independent of the vector's direction. These unit vectors let me define the magnitude and direction separately. Likewise, a sub y times j is a vector along the y-axis that is a sub y units long. I can add these two vectors by simply putting the tail of the j vector at the head of the i vector. The sum is this vector that goes from the tail of the i vector to the head of the j vector. I call that vector a. I can define a vector that points to any point in the xy plane with a combination of i and j vectors and their magnitudes. In vector notation, here's how I express vector a as the sum of a sub x and a sub y. Note here that a sub x and a sub y are vectors. The font is bold, which des designates that they're vectors. If I put the bold a sub x in straight brackets, it represents the scalar magnitude or length of a sub x. If I multiply that scalar times the unit vector i, then I get the quantity that's equal to the vector a sub x. Likewise, a sub y in brackets is equal to the magnitude of a sub y. And if I multiply that times the unit vector j, that is equal to the vector a sub y. Vector a is thus equal to a sub x i and a sub y j. And this is a simpler way to write that. Note that a sub x and a sub y are not bold, hence their scalar magnitudes. Now I'll add a vector along the z-axis, a sub z times k. I'll then put that at the head of this vector. Now the a vector points into three-dimensional space. The vector a is now the sum of the a sub x, a sub y, and a sub z vectors. That equals a sub x times i plus a sub y times j plus a sub z times k. The magnitude of the two-dimensional vector a is the square root of the magnitude of a sub x squared plus the magnitude of a sub y squared. This is the Pythagorean theorem. The magnitude of the three-dimensional vector is the square root of a sub x squared plus a sub y squared plus a sub z squared. I can multiply a vector by a scalar. c times a is c times ax times i plus c times ay times j plus c times az times k. I added vectors geometrically on the previous slide. Here's how you do it algebraically. a plus b is ax plus bx i plus ay plus by j plus az plus bz k. Adding two vectors is trivial. There are two ways to multiply vectors, the dot product and the cross product. Both are unlike simple numeric multiplication. Here on the right, I'm showing you the dot product. The dot product of two vectors is the magnitude of a times the magnitude of b times the cosine of the angle between the vectors. The result of the dot product is a scalar. It has no direction. I'll show you in a moment how that works. First, I want to say that um, a dot b equals b dot a, so dot products are commutative. OK, here's how it works. Here are the two vectors a and b. Theta is the angle between them. The length of this segment along b is a cosine theta. That's the projection of A on B. Think of this as the amount of vector A that points in the B direction. Likewise, this is the projection of B on A. It equals B cosine theta. 
Think of this as the amount of vector b that points in the a direction. If you divide the dot product by the magnitude of a, you get the projection of a on b. Likewise, if you divide the dot product by the magnitude of b, you get the projection of b on a. And that's essentially how the dot product works. And this is just a convention. Um, you'll see why it's useful later. Um, but suffice it to say that a dot b equals a b cosine theta. So if a and b are perpendicular, which is what that little symbol is between the a and the b, or if they're orthogonal, which <clears throat> means the same as perpendicular, then the dot product equals zero. This makes sense. The amount of a that projects onto b is zero if the two vectors are perpendicular. If you look at this algebraically, since the cosine of 90 or the cosine of pi or 2 over 2 is 0, then the dot product is 0. If a and b are collinear, and those two little lines between a and b means collinear, it means they point in the same direction. Then the dot product is simply a times b, since the cosine of 0 is 1. Since the unit vectors are all orthogonal with each other, that means that i dot j equals j dot k equals k dot i, and all of those equal zero. The dot product of a vector with itself, for instance, a dot a, is the magnitude of a times a times the cosine of zero. The cosine of zero is one, so this simply equals the scalar a squared. If I take the dot product of the unit vectors, i dot i, j dot j, and k dot k, they all equal 1 since their magnitudes, of one, magnitudes are 1, and 1 squared is 1. a dot b plus c equals a dot b plus a dot c. And here's an interesting derivation. a dot i, and i being the unit vector along the i-axis, is i dot ax i plus ayj plus azk. And that equals ax i dot i plus ay j dot i plus az k dot i. And because j and i and k and i are orthogonal, that simplifies, and, and because i dot i is equal to 1, that simplifies to a sub x. So if you want the magnitude of a along the x-axis, you take the dot product of a and i. Likewise, if you want the magnitude along the y-axis, you take the dot product of a and j. And along the z-axis, you take the dot product of a and k. a dot b equals ax i plus ayj plus azk dot bxi plus byj plus bzk. And all I did here was I broke down a and b into their i, j, and k components. And then if I multiply that out, it's AXBX I dot I plus AYBY J dot J plus AZBZ K dot K and then AXBY I dot J and I put the ellipses there because every term that comes after that is going to be the dot product of two orthogonal unit vectors and thus they'll all equal zero. The I dot I, J dot J and K dot K are equal to one. So this simplifies to AXBX plus AYBY plus AZBZ. So the dot product of two vectors is equal to the product of the individual X component, Y component, and Z component summed together. I said there were two ways to multiply vectors. I just showed you the dot product. Now I'll show you the cross product, which I talked about in part nine. The Cartesian coordinate system we use is named after Rene Descartes, and it's a right-handed coordinate system. If you orient your right hand like this, your thumb corresponds to the z-axis. Your index finger that is pointing straight out forms a right angle with your thumb and corresponds to the x-axis. And your middle finger, which points at a right angle to your index finger and thumb, corresponds to the y-axis. Let's consider two vectors a and b. The magnitude of the cross product of a and b is the magnitude of a times the magnitude of b times the sine of the angle between them, theta. This is by convention. You can also express the magnitude this way. The cross product results in a vector. This is what that vector looks like. The direction is orthogonal, which means at right angles to both vectors a and b. We also sometimes say that the vector that results from a cross b is normal to a and b.
Again, this is by convention. A cross B is thus another vector whose direction is orthogonal to both A and B. If A and B are in the xy plane, then A cross B points along the z-axis. This follows the right-hand rule. You can think of the magnitude of A cross B as the area of this parallelogram. The area of a parallelogram is base times height. The lengths of the sides are A and B. The height is B sine theta. The base is simply A. If the parallelogram were a rectangle, the area would sim is simply base times height because the sine of 90 degrees or pi over two radians is one. As the angle theta gets smaller, the area of the parallelogram shrinks. As theta approaches zero, the area approaches zero and the sine of zero radians or zero degrees is zero. This animation demonstrates the effect. When it, the angle is less, is negative, the normal vector points down. When the angle is positive, the normal vector points up. When it's orthogonal, it's at its maximum height. When it's collinear, it goes down to zero. And when it's greater than pi radians or negative, it points down. For cross products, if you cross a vector with itself, it equals zero. For that matter, if you cross any collinear vector with itself, it equals zero because the sine of zero is zero. This identity is used a lot in derivations for orbital dynamics. I cross J equals K. I and J are orthogonal to each other and their magnitudes are equal to one. The cross product is the vector that is orthogonal to both, which is along the Z axis. And because the magnitudes are one and one times one is one, the magnitude of the cross product is also one. So the cross product is simply K. Likewise, J cross K equals I and K cross I equals J. These identities are also used a lot. If I break down A cross B into X, Y, and Z vector components, the cross product can be expressed this way. If you multiply out all the terms, all the collinear ones cancel and you're left with this. The triple cross product A cross B cross C is the dot product of C and A, C dot A, um, cross B minus B dot A cross C. Here I want to talk about taking the derivative of a vector function. I'm going to use vectors for position, velocity, and acceleration, and I'm going to want to determine instantaneous formulas for all of them. That means I'm going to have to take derivatives. This is an x, y, z coordinate system. Here's a position vector. And let's say it moves along this curve. I'm going to define a function r of t that represents the curve. And it may not be clear, but the r character is bold, meaning that r is a vector. I want to break r into x, y, and z vectors. Notice that r, x, y, and z are all a function of t. This is what's known as a parametric equation. x, y, and z are coordinates in the three-dimensional coordinate system, but they vary over time. There's an additional time coordinate, t, that allows x, y, and z, and hence r, to vary over time. This equation is that I've showed you here is kind of nonsensical. Vectors in, three -dimensional, in a three-dimensional coordinate system have three coordinates each, yet I define x, y, and z as vectors. It makes a lot more sense to make the parametric functions for x, y, and z scalar equations and then use the unit vectors to imply their direction. Since I'm going to compute coordinates for position, velocity, and acceleration, I want to express x of t and as r sub x, y of t as r sub y, and z of t as r sub z. So here I'm just dealing with a lot of formalisms. In a bit, you'll see why this all makes sense. Average velocity over a delta t time is the position at time t plus delta t minus the position at t and all of that over delta t. 
I can break that down into X, Y, and Z components or I, J, and K components. Now, if I take the limit as delta T approaches zero of the formula for X, that equals dx dt. So I can take the derivatives of each of the x, y, and z functions, and that equals dr dt. And that equals the instantaneous velocity function v of t. This is the scalar for the x component of velocity. This is the speed, not the velocity along the x-axis. Here's the y component, the speed along the y-axis. And here's the z component, the speed along the z axis. And remember, a vector, a velocity is a vector, meaning it has magnitude and um, direction. If I express these velocities as um, scalars, they're speeds. In part 13, I showed you that a derivative function is tangent to the underlying function. Hence, the velocity vector would go tangent to the r function. And I'll show you a specific example of this later. Remember here, the velocity has both magnitude and direction. Acceleration is a measure of the change in velocity. A bar is the average acceleration over time delta t. Since I have a velocity function, I can determine average acceleration is the velocity at time t plus delta t minus the velocity at time t over delta t. You'll recall that acceleration is the derivative of velocity, which I get if I take the limit. Um, of this average acceleration function. Hence, acceleration is the double derivative of position. Um, here are the double derivatives of the x, y, and z functions. And it's simpler to express these as a sub x, a sub y, and a sub z. And all I'm showing you here is notation. It's a formalism that's used to characterize motion in three dimensions. In orbital dynamics, the dynamics or the motions in three dimensions three-dimensional space are caused by forces. Forces impart acceleration, which results in changes in velocity. And from that, we can determine positions over time. What I'm showing you here is how that's characterized. Here's a simple one-dimensional case from Galileo's law of falling bodies. I'll show you how to use Newton's second law to model a ball falling. Newton's second law does not change Galileo's description of trajectories, but it puts several separate insights into a unifying, unified framework and expresses them in a concise way. Here's an object falling. Notice that it starts at rest and then picks up velocity as it moves downward. That implies there's some acceleration. In order to characterize this motion, I'll start with f equals ma and use this to deduce the trajectory of a projectile. Galileo computed the force of gravity as a constant downward acceleration, which I'll write as a equals minus g times the vector unit vector k, where k is the unit vector along the z-axis. The minus sign implies that this is downward acceleration. Since f equals ma, it follows that the downward force is f equals minus mgk. In part th 13, I showed you that the acceleration was the derivative of velocity, and that equaled minus g, and that equaled minus 9.81 meters per second squared. The velocity at time t is the derivative of position, and it equals minus g times t. And the position is minus 1 half g times t squared. That's the equation I use to model the motion in the animation on the right. If I multiply acceleration times mass, I get the form. That equals mass times the derivative of velocity, and that equals the mass times the double derivative of position. If I multiply mass times the velocity, I get the momentum. That equals the mass times the derivative of position. I didn't really need the force and momentum equations here since I already knew the acceleration. In the next part, I'll talk about Newton's law of gravitation. That is a force equation which we can use to derive acceleration and then velocity and position. Galileo did that empirically when he measured um, balls rolling down ramps. Newton was able to do that mathematically. This animation is a ball with no downward acceleration. Some force, however, causes it to accelerate horizontally, which um, is set up with an initial velocity. There's no horizontal acceleration beyond this, so A of t is zero. The horizontal velocity is constant, so some force causes this velocity, but it happened before the simulation. So this velocity is an initial condition. 
And then the position is simply velocity times time. Note that I added subscripts to A, B, and R. I picked the x-axis as the horizontal axis and Z is the vertical axis. Galileo's discussion of projectile motion, the law of falling bodies govern the vertical motion and the law of inertia govern the horizontal motion. The two laws in Galileo's mind were unrelated. In Newton's formulation, the first law concerning inertia appears as simply a special case of the second law, applying when no force is present. Since F equals ma is a vector equation that includes the summation of all external forces, it includes Galileo's case of a force combined to the vertical direction with no acceleration in the horizontal direction. This means that the equation for the vertical component motion is the same as the equations for the horizontal component of motion. That makes the formulas much simpler. Here I change the vertical equations so the terms all have z subscripts. I picked x as the horizontal axis. These are the equations um, in the x-axis for the motion of the red ball. There's no horizontal acceleration, no horizontal velocity, and no change in horizontal position. Here are the equations in the x-axis for the blue ball that moves in parabolic motion. Before the animation, there was some force that resulted in an initial velocity. From there, the ball moves horizontally at that constant velocity. The horizontal position is the initial velocity times time. The z component of force is minus m times g times the unit vector k, and there is no x component of force. That's consistent with there being no x component of acceleration. Compound motion is very cleverly illustrated by an experiment at MIT. There's a golf ball gun that is aimed at a monkey, not a real monkey, but a stuffed animal monkey, that's suspended on a tower with an electromagnet. Now when the ball is fired, the electromagnet is simultaneously shut off and the ball is aimed directly at the monkey. However, this ball is going to travel with some trajectory and hence it'll experience the downward force of gravity. And you'll see that both objects fall at the same rate. So in the beginning, if you aim the ball at the monkey, it will hit the monkey dead on because both objects experience the same force of gravity. And again, that was a stuffed animal monkey. No real monkeys were used in this demonstration. In this animation, I'm showing the acceleration of velocity vector and both the horizontal and vertical components of velocity. The acceleration vector for the ball in parabolic motion is the sum of the x component of acceleration and the y component of acceleration. And since there is no x component of acceleration, that simply equals the y component of acceleration. So if you watch the ball in parabolic trajectory closely, you'll see that the red vector pointing down never changes in magnitude. The velocity vector is also the sum of the x component of velocity and the y component of velocity. That equals the initial velocity times t times i for the x component and minus gt times k for the y component. And in this case, you can see the horizontal velocity vector stays constant, the vertical velocity vector grows over time, and the net velocity vector grows over time and changes direction. And if you look very closely, you'll notice that the velocity vector on the ball moving in parabolic motion is the sum of the horizontal and vertical components. This animation makes that a little more clear.
This is a single ball following in parabolic motions. The three vectors are velocity vectors. And you can see an x component of velocity, a y component of velocity, and the z component of velocity. And you can see if we add x and y, we get z. And so they always kind of form a rectangle, or the, yeah, the horizontal and vertical form a rectangle, and the velocity vector would be the diagonal. With combined knowledge of the law of falling bodies and the law of inertia, I can determine the path of an object's trajectory. I'm assuming downward acceleration due to gravity with some initial horizontal and upward vertical velocity to get things started. The starting point for the x-axis is r sub x0, and for the z-axis is r sub z0. In this animation, I set both of those to zero. That centers the starting point at the origin of the coordinate system. The initial horizontal velocity is v sub x0. The initial vertical velocity is v sub z0. The initial horizontal acceleration is a sub x0. And the initial vertical acceleration is a sub z0. Here's the parametric equation for the x-coordinate. It's the initial x-coordinate r sub x0 plus the initial velocity times time t plus one half the initial horizontal acceleration times times t squared. Here's the equation for the y coordinate. It's the initial z coordinate r sub z0 plus the initial z velocity times time t minus one half the initial vertical acceleration times the time t squared. In this animation, I the initial starting point is 0, 0. There's an initial vertical and horizontal velocity, and the horizontal acceleration is zero with the vertical acceleration equaling minus g. These parameters result in the animation you see on the right. Given these parameters, the equation for the x-coordinate simplifies to this, and the equation for the z-coordinate simplifies to this. I did those animations in Python. I want to show you how I did them in GeoGebra. GeoGebra is a free web-based geometry sketching application. I first want to set up the x and y components of acceleration. So the x component of acceleration I'll set to zero. And the y component of acceleration I'll set to minus 9.81. And then I want to set up the uh, components of velocity. So the x component of velocity will be 10. And the y component of velocity will be 0. And then I want to set the uh, x and y components of position. And I'll set those to 0, 0. And these are the initial conditions. And then I'm going to plot a parametric curve trajectory and the x-coordinate will be rx plus vx times t, and I'll define t later, plus 1 half ax times t squared. And then the y component is going to look very similar. r sub y plus v sub y t plus one half a sub y times t squared. And then the third argument is t, the parameter. And then t is going to go from 0 to 5. And you can see that plotted a nice half parabola from 0 to 5. And this is the trajectory of an object that starts at 0, 0 with an initial horizontal um, velocity of 10 and a downward acceleration of 9.81. And notice all these parameters have sliders, so I can adjust the um, horizontal acceleration, in this case, I want to keep it at zero. 
so this emulates gravity. I can change the initial position. If I change the X, it just moves the curve to the right. If I change the Y, it just moves the curve up and down. And then I'm actually going to make the horizontal velocity a little greater so there's more curvature to the curve. And I'll set that to 15. So that trajectory curve is actually a function. And so I can define t. This is the time constant. And it's going to go from 0 to 5 in increments of 0.1. And I'll show you why the increments are important um, a little bit later. And then I'm going to plot a point using the trajectory function. And it's going to be the tra trajectory based on t. So that trajectory function is a parametric equation. And as I move the slider for t, it moves the point p along the curve. Now I'm going to define a position vector. It'll, the um, tail will be at 0, 0, and the head will be at the x-coordinate of p and the y-coordinate of p. And segment gives me a straight line. And I'm going to change the color of this to green. And now as I change the parameter t, the time, my position vector changes as well as the point p. And then here, I want to plot the x component of velocity. And that's v sub x times t. I'm sorry, v sub x plus a sub x times t. And then the y component of velocity, v sub y plus a sub y times t. So now I've computed an x and a y for velocity, and if I want to plot a velocity point, it's just v sub x and v sub y. Now that's velocity with respect to the origin of the coordinate system. And you can see the velocity changes direction and it increases as the position increases. But this isn't very intuitive. I actually want the velocity, the origin of velocity function to be at the um, point P. So I'm simply going to add x and y. I made a mistake there. I'm going to add the um, x coordinate of P to V sub x and the y coordinate of P to V sub y. And now if I draw a line segment V, from P to V, I get a velocity vector. So again, if I hadn't added the P sub X and P sub Y to V, the velocity vector would have um, originated at the origin of the coordinate system. It's a little more intuitive to have a velocity vector originate at P. So now you can see the velocity vector points in the direction of motion of P, and it's tangent to the curve trajectory. Now, this is uh, acceleration, and it's pretty easy. It's just a sub x and a sub y. And again, I want to add um, the p coordinates to a sub x and a sub y. So this point originates at the position p. <clears throat> and then the acceleration vector is going to be a line segment from p to a. And again, I only define downward acceleration. I'll change the color of this to blue. I define constant downward acceleration so it points downward and it never changes. So here you have position, 
velocity and acceleration vectors plotted. Now, there's a cool feature in GeoGebra. If I set the slider to increasing, it'll actually run this as an animation. And I don't think the timing here is perfect. Um, the reason why I set the increments on the T slider was to paste this animation. But you can kind of see P moves a little slower at the top, faster at the bottom. You can definitely see the velocity vector growing as P moves in its trajectory. And here I can hide the acceleration vector. And now I want to plot the horizontal component of velocity and the vertical component of velocity. So this would be the horizontal component. And it's v sub x plus x sub p, because I also want this to originate at the point p. And then it's just simply y sub p. I want it to extend out vertically. And then the y component of velocity is the uh, coordinate for p, the x coordinate for p. And then the y coordinate of that point is v sub y plus the y coordinate of p. And it makes more intuitive sense if you look at where they're plotted. So now I can define a line segment Vx, which is the vector for the x component of velocity. It starts at P and it goes to Vy, uh, Vx, excuse me. And the y component of velocity is a line segment going from P to Vy. And then I'll change these colors again. So it's pretty obvious here that the sum of Vx and Vy is V. And if you take the tail of Vx and put it at the head of Vy, the head of Vx would be at V. And so you can see here that Vx is constant. The horizontal component of velocity is constant because there is no horizontal acceleration. The Y component keeps growing. And that's why the direction of V keeps pointing downward. And in the very beginning, when Vy is 0, V is coincident with Vx. It points horizontally. Now I want to talk about the kind of compound motion that is applicable to orbiting satellites. This is one case, a special case, called the uniform circular motion. The circular motion part's intuitive. Uniform implies that the satellite travels at the same speed throughout the orbit. So speed is a scalar quantity. If you're driving in your car at 55 miles per hour, that's your speed. If you're driving north in your car at 55 miles per hour, then your velocity is 55 miles per hour in the northern direction. So velocity has both a directional component and a scalar component. If you drive home in the opposite direction, you can say you're driving 55 miles per hour in the southern direction, or you could say minus 55 miles per hour in the northern direction. They both mean the same thing. So I want to um, formalize uniform circular motion mathematically. Um, I'll characterize the components of motion, which are position, velocity, and acceleration with vectors. I'm not going to do force here. I'll do that in the next part. Um, so here I'm just going to focus on position, velocity, and acceleration. And I'm going to use uh, two-dimensional vectors. Um, I don't need this to do this in three dimensions. When I do orbital dynamics, it'll be in three dimensions. But for now, um, I'll just use two because I don't need the third. And this gets into a lot of calculus and mainly derivatives. In fact, what I'm going to show you demonstrates why we need calculus to characterize this kind of motion. OK, so here's an xy coordinate system. And here's the position vector, the purple vector. And then here is the vector notation for r. So if you look closely, r is emboldened. The length of r is, if you put the bold r in vertical brackets, that's the scalar length of r. And here I'm separating r into x and y components. So r sub x is the length of r along the x-axis. And then I multiply that by the unit vector i to give it a direction. r sub y is the length of r along the y-axis. And I multiply that times the unit vector j to give it a direction. 
So R forms this angle theta with the x-axis. And so R sub x equals R cosine theta and R sub y equals R sine theta. And I can make those substitutions here. So the vector R is now a function of the scalar length of R and the angle theta, and this puts um, R in polar coordinates. I now have an equation that gives me a position and a position vector. The position vector on the circle is the purple line, and it is defined by the origin, 0, 0, and then this formula, which gives you the, the position point. So now back to the derivation. So, oh, I'm sorry. Um, here's some equalities that I'm going to need to use. Um, the, d theta dt is the cosine of theta. I'm sorry, d theta dt of the cosine theta is minus the sine of theta. So the derivative of the cosine is minus sine. d theta dt of sine theta is cosine theta. So the derivative of the sine is the cosine with no change in sine. And I derived these for you in an earlier part. And then um, I showed you this as well. Sine theta squared plus cosine theta squared equals 1. So now back to the derivation. So here is the circular path and the circle centered on the coordinate system. Here is the position vector. And then here is the position P of a satellite. And here's the angle theta. So I want the satellite to move around the circle um, through time. So I'm going to add the parameter t. Um, I'll simply express theta as a function of t and we'll make it equal to omega t. Um, so the units of theta are radians. The units for t is seconds. And that means that omega is radians per second. And you have to do that for the units to work out. Um, but omega is known as the angular speed. And t is the time. So um, the angular speed is omega radians per second, and then the time elapsed is t seconds. And if you multiply those two, you end up with radians because the seconds cancel. OK, if I know, um, I'm sorry. So the time for a 2 pi rotation is called the period um, and is denoted with a capital T. Um, if I know the period, I can derive omega by dividing 2 pi times the period, capital T. And I can solve for omega in this equation, and I get omega equals 2 pi over the period T. Um, the variable T just thus goes from 0 to capital T, the period. So if it takes 4 seconds for P to rotate through 2 pi radians, then T equals 4. So I can now substitute omega t for theta in this equation for r sub x. And now r is a function of t. So this is now a parametric equation. And it's a function of time, t. I can do the same for r sub y. And the vector now is a function of t. So this is the proper way to signify r. However, in many of the texts, it's assumed that r is a function of t. Hence, you don't always see the t in parentheses. So I now have a parametric equation that takes t as an input. Um, you could say that r and omega are also variables. That's true, but for these kinds of equations, r and omega are really initial conditions. That means we pick a radius r and an angular speed omega, and then we vary t from 0 to capital T. And that's how this equation is meant to work. So usually what we're after in equations like these is the position of an object. In this case, I already have an equation for the position. In the next part, however, I'm going to talk to you about Newton's um, law of gravity. That it quantifies the force of gravity. And so with that force equation, you can infer the acceleration. And then from there, you can compute the velocity. And from that, you can compute the position. So when dealing with forces, we go from force to acceleration to velocity and then to position. In this example, I'm going the other way around so I can derive formulas for the velocity and acceleration and then I can use those later. So here is the basic equation for velocity. It's the derivative of the position function expressed as dr dt. So remember, the derivative of position is velocity. And then we know geometrically the velocity is tangent to the path of the object, and then it points in the direction of motion. So the equation for r results in counterclockwise motion. So the velocity vector would point in this direction.
So I have an equation for position, and I know the velocity is the derivative of position. The next step here is to take the derivative of the formula for r. So I have a formula for velocity, for v. So I can break dr dt into x and y components. dr dt equals dr sub x dt times i plus dr sub y dt times j. And here I'm the, the scalar component, the x, the scalar x component of velocity v sub x is the derivative of the x component of position. So I can do these as separate derivatives. And so here I'll substitute r cosine omega t for r sub x. And now I can take the derivative of cosine omega t with respect to t, which I actually can't do. I can either take the derivative with respect to t or I can take the derivative of something that's a function of omega t with respect to omega t, but I, I can't take a derivative of omega t with respect to t. That was kind of a mouthful. But the way you do this in calculus is with something called the chain rule. With the chain rule, I first take the derivative of cosine omega t with respect to omega t, and then I take the derivative of omega t itself with respect to t. And then the calculus works out. So the derivative of r cosine omega t with respect to omega t is uh, can be simplified. It's equal to r times the derivative um, of cosine omega t alone. And so all I did here was I took r, uh, which is a constant outside the derivative. And um, you'll see above the derivative of the cosine function is the minus sign. So this equals minus r sine omega t. And then the derivative of omega t with respect to t is simply omega, since the derivative of t with respect to t is 1. And omega with respect to t is a constant. So v sub x is thus equal to minus r omega sine omega t. So I've got the x coordinate. Now the y component of velocity, v sub y, is the derivative of the y component of position, r sub y. And here I'm substituting r sine omega t for r sub y. And then I'll use the chain rule again to take the derivative of r sine omega t with respect to omega t, and then omega t with respect to t. The derivative of r sine omega t with respect to omega t equals r times the derivative of sine omega t with respect to omega t. And all I did here was factor out the r. And the derivative of the sine function is the, is the cosine, so this equals r cosine omega t. And then I showed you above that the derivative of omega t with respect to t is omega. That means that the y component of velocity is r omega cosine omega t. The velocity vector thus equals minus r omega sine omega t times the unit vector i plus r omega cosine omega t times the unit vector j. Um, and then with the i and j terms in this equation, this is a vector equation. So like I showed you, geometrically, the velocity vector is perpendicular or orthogonal to the position vector. For a circle, this has to be the case. The law of inertia states that absent any force, an object will move in a straight line. That's what the velocity vector depicts, the forward motion. With an ellipse, the velocity vector is tangent to the elliptical path and thus is not always perpendicular to the position vector. With a circle, the tangent has to be orthogonal to the position vector. And you can see that intuitively. But I'd like to prove this algebraically, and I can do that with the dot product. So you recall from a few slides ago that the dot product of two orthogonal vectors is zero. So if r and v are indeed perpendicular, then r dot v would equal zero. So let's see if that works out. So r dot v is r sub x times v sub x plus r sub y times v sub y. And that's the definition of the dot product that I showed you earlier. And then here are all the terms um, I just derived. So r sub x is r cosine omega t. v sub x is minus r omega sine omega t. r sub y is r sine omega t. And v sub y is r omega cosine omega t. So going back to the equation on the bottom, I can factor out two r's and one omega in each of the terms that I'm adding. Now each term is multiplied by r squared omega. And the first term is negative because of the minus r omega sine omega t. The first term of this sum, if you look closely, is minus r squared omega cosine omega t sine omega t. The next term is r squared omega sine omega t cosine omega t. So if you swap 
one of the cosine and sine functions, you can see that the two terms are the same, except that one is positive and one is negative, which means this is equal to zero. So that proves algebraically that the velocity vector is orthogonal to the position vector. I now want to derive the speed of the point that's in circular motion. I know the angular speed omega. This is the speed in meters per second. So according to the Pythagorean theorem, v equals the square root of the x component of v squared plus the y component of v squared. So v sub x equals r minus r omega sine omega t and v sub y equals r omega cosine omega t. I can factor out r squared omega squared from both those terms. And then if you look in the parentheses, sine of omega t squared plus cosine of omega t squared equals 1. So this reduces to the square root of r squared omega squared, and that equals r omega. So the speed, v, equals r times omega. Omega is the angular speed. And because v is r times omega, if the circle is larger, the radius r is larger, and hence the speed is greater. Likewise, if r is smaller, the speed is lower. The units of velocity, that just popped up in the middle of the screen, if you didn't see it. V equals meters per second. So the unit velocities are in meters per second, and the units of angular speed is in radians per second. So as I said a moment ago, this is a vector equation. It plots a point that is the tip of the velocity vector with the tail at the origin of the coordinate system. If you plotted this vector, it would look like this. In this diagram, I showed you the velocity vector starts at the position P. And I think it's more intuitive that way. So here are the coordinates for the position vector. The tail's at the origin of the coordinate system, and the head is at R sub X and R sub Y. So here's how you shift the coordinates to the velocity vector. The tail of the vector is at R sub X and R sub Y, and the head which is the head of the position vector. And then the head of the velocity vector is at r sub x plus v sub x and r sub y plus v sub y. So velocity is the derivative of position and acceleration is the derivative of velocity. And then geometrically, we know that there must be an inward acceleration for an object to stay in circular motion. So think of this like a ball on a string. The string provides the inward acceleration. If the string snaps, the ball will travel in a straight line along its velocity vector. If you spin the ball in a circle, you feel tension on the string. That's the inward acceleration. So here I want to derive a formula for acceleration and then prove that it's orthogonal to velocity. So like I did before, I'll break acceleration up into its x and y components. That breaks down in the derivative of the x component of velocity times the unit vector i plus the derivative of the y component of velocity times the unit vector j. This is the x component of velocity, and I'll make that substitution here. Then I use the chain rule. The derivative of the sine function is the cosine, so this derivative equals minus r omega cosine omega t, and the derivative of omega t is omega. So this equals minus r omega squared cosine omega t. Then here's the y component of velocity. I'll make that substitution here. And then I use the chain rule again. The derivative of the cosine function is the minus sine function. And the derivative um, is thus minus r omega squared sine omega t. And so here's the formula for the acceleration vector. Now, there's an interesting reduction I can do with this to prove that it's orthogonal to the velocity vector. I can factor out minus omega squared and then look closely at the formula in brackets. This is the same formula as the formula for r. So you see those two are identical. So this formula very simply reduces to minus omega squared r. So um, what that means is acceleration is collinear with position and in the opposite direction, which uh, by definition means if velocity is perpendicular to um, position, then acceleration must be perpendicular to velocity, and then acceleration and velocity must be collinear. So um, 
is a scalar acceleration equals r times omega squared. So here, if you increase the angular uh, speed, the acceleration um, increases by the square of the angular speed. And again, if you increase the radius, the acceleration by definition must increase. So now I want to show you how to model this with GeoGebra. So I'm going to start by defining a radius. And that will range from 0 to 10. And again, I told you before, radius is usually an initial condition. Um, this is a slider, so I can show you what happens when I adjust the radius. And then now position is a curve which is equal to r times cosine theta for the x-coordinate. And the y-coordinate is r times sine theta. And then the parameter in this equation is theta. And it ranges from 0 to 2 pi. And now, not only do I have a curve, but I have a position function, which I can use later. And I actually want to hide this label. And now you see, as I, as I vary r, the size of the circle changes. All right, I'll set that back to 4. And this will be the period. And I'll set initially to 3, and I want the period to range from 0 to 10. And then like I showed you before, if I know the period, I can infer the angular speed. So angular speed is 2 pi divided by the period. And that's angular speed in radians per, you know, call t three seconds, radians per second. And then t is going to be the variable parameter that will allow me to step through this animation. And because the period is capital T, t will go from zero to capital T. And then once little t hits um, the value for capital T, it'll reset to zero. So here I'm just showing you if I vary capital T, I vary the maximum for T. Okay, I'll change that back to 4. And I want to set an origin point. I'll use this when I plot the vectors. And this will be the position point. And I'll use the position function. And now it's going to be based on omega t. And you remember I did that substitution before where I substituted omega t for theta. And then I don't want t to go up and down. I want it to go from 0 to 4 and then back to 0. And so if I go to the slider settings, I can have it be increasing. Otherwise, it would oscillate back and forth. And now it's just going to keep going around and around. And you can see if I increase the period, the ball goes slower. OK, so that's basic circular motion. And I'll, I'll make the step smaller. It's a little smoother if I make it smaller. This is basic circular motion with a simple um, equation for position in polar coordinates. Yeah, here you can see it goes a lot slower. OK, I'll set that back to 4 and this back to 0. And now I'm going to set up a velocity vector. So the v point is 
minus r omega sine omega t. And I, I forgot some multiplication operators there. I'll fix that in a minute. And then the y coordinate is r omega cosine omega t. Now, the one other thing about plotting this in GeoGebra is, let's say I made a mistake. If I did, this vector wouldn't turn out right. So I do this all the time where I do derivations and I can check my work here. All right, there's the velocity point. And like I told you before, the origin of that point is at the origin of the coordinate system. So here I'm going to plot a position vector. I'm going to use 0, 0 for the origin because I don't want that ever to change. And P for the head. And then I'm going to change the color of that to red. And then this is a velocity vector. It also is going to start at the origin 0, 0 and go to V. So this is what the velocity vector looks like if you plot it with its uh, tail uh, at the, at the uh, origin of the coordinate system. So this is a useful way to plot it, but um, it's more intuitive to have the origin be at the point P. And the way you do that is just by adding P to V. And adding P to this origin O. And then the origin of p doesn't change in the way I did this because I hard coded that to zero zero. So now I get a, a velocity vector that's actually tangent to the path of motion, and then you can see it changing. So this is a a more intuitive way I feel to show a velocity vector. Now notice if I increase the period, the velocity vector gets shorter, which makes intuitive sense. Longer period, slower velocity. If I decrease the period, the velocity vector gets a lot longer, which implies the angular velocity is much higher for the lower period. If I increase the radius, the velocity increases. It was kind of hard to tell because it was proportional, but that is a higher velocity. If I decrease the radius, the velocity vector shrinks. And again, if I increase or decrease the period, it changes the length of the velocity vector as well. So if you have a ball on a longer string and you spin it at the same angular rate, it's going at a faster speed. Okay. I've reset all those parameters. Now I want to add acceleration. So this is, the, this is the acceleration point. And acceleration, if you recall, on the previous slide is minus r omega squared cosine of omega t. And then minus r omega squared sine omega t. And you can see on the left by the minus a and the a, there's a point plotted. And this is opposite to the position vector. So the, the acceleration vector will be um, O and A. And then I'll change the color of this. And so the origin of this acceleration vector is um, the position vector. And so I also need to add P to the A point. Otherwise, the, the A vector is too long. And the acceleration vectors superimpose on the position vector, so they're overlapping each other.
But you can see um, tangential velocity and inward acceleration. So in order to achieve uniform circular motion, you've got to have a velocity that put the ball in motion, but then you need an inward acceleration to keep it going in a circle. And if I change the period, the acceleration changes as well as the velocity. But remember, acceleration is a function of omega. I'm sorry, I didn't change omega. If I change the shape, uh, the acceleration changes as well. Yeah, that t period will change omega. So if I change t, it changes um, the acceleration by the square of omega. So acceleration changes more than velocity does. Now I want to take out these offsets, and this is going to recenter the, the vectors at the origin of the coordinate system. And now you can see all three vectors, um, and acceleration is no longer superimposed. So if I change the period, it significantly changes acceleration and it changes velocity to a lesser extent. And that's what the vectors look like centered at the origin of the coordinate system. Now, I actually prefer to plot them this way. OK, so that's the basic animation for uniform circular motion using the equations I derived on the earlier slide. And now you can see why we need calculus to um, mathematically model these kinds of motion. The main takeaways from this part are Newton's three laws of motion that characterize forces, uh, the law of inertia, the fact that an orbiting body really wants to travel in a straight line, and the deflection of an orbit on a circular or elliptical path um, has to result from an acceleration. And then I talked about cross products, dot products, and I showed you uniform circular motion. So a lot of algebra here, but this kind of gives you a sense of how calculus enables us to derive equations um, for simple orbital motion.